Good morning, Nexus, and welcome to our online Good Friday sermon. Glad you are with us, taking some time on your long weekend here to be with us as we remember and come together to think about Good Friday. And, you know, every year at this time, Kristen likes to joke with me, you know, about these two services, Good Friday, Easter Sunday. What are you going to do this year, Brad, to make things memorable and special? Are you going to have some surprise new ending and... Uh, You know, hey, the story is the story. Good Friday, Easter Sunday. And, you know, I'll confess that this year has proven rather difficult uh, to find words around these two pillar days of the Christian faith, right? Uh, Easter, Good Friday, they are inseparable. And they are the pillars of the Christian faith. Because if you skip Good Friday then Resurrection Sunday celebrations, they start to feel a little bit cheap, you know? And there's something important, I think, about Good Friday, about lingering around the cross. It is the center, it is the scandal, you could say, of our Christian faith. And so even if the story is familiar, perhaps too familiar, it warrants our time and attention. So thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you for being with us. And I want to start this morning by focusing on a marquee moment in Jesus' life that put Jesus on a trajectory, I would say, a collision course with the cross. And think about your own life right now, some marquee moments in your own life. You know, I can think of a number of marquee moments in my life. I remember very vividly the the couchette I was staying in on this train, traveling from Nice, France to Rome, Italy. And uh, my friend Dan and I are on this overnight couchette train. And I remember that moment because it was the first time that my friend had said to me, the first time I'd ever heard someone say, maybe you should become a pastor. I remember it vividly, that train ride. And the first time I had ever, that thought had even crossed my mind. And at that moment, it sent me on a trajectory that would change the course of my life, alter the course of my life. Or I remember the very first moment that I saw Kristen. I remember it as clear as day. I walked into this class and she was the only one in class sitting there and I thought to myself well here's an interesting opportunity and so I sat down beside her but I kept one seat in between us I didn't want to be too creepy sitting right next to her especially in a classroom with plenty of seats I sat one seat over struck up a conversation would you know it some schmuck comes and sits right in between the two of us but There was electricity, there was was chemistry right from the beginning, and I had the nerve after class to ask her for her phone number. The rest, you could say, is history. Moments like that, moments in all of our lives, we all have them, that a decision was made, something happened that alters the course of our lives. There are moments and events that shape the trajectory of our lives. And as it is with us, so it is with Jesus. And as we consider the cross, I believe there's a single moment in his life that made the cross the inevitable conclusion of his life. And I believe that moment happened during his time in the wilderness, during his temptations. You'll recall from a few weeks ago, right? Jesus is out in the wilderness. He's in this parched desert landscape with harsh, unforgiving terrain. There's predatory animals and he's fasting, he's praying, he's getting himself ready for ministry. And during this period, the devil comes to Jesus by way, I believe, of serpentine thoughts. Have you ever had serpentine thoughts yourself? Thoughts so dark, twisted, distorted, disturbing that it it rattles you a little? Why on earth would that thought come into my head? It's happened to me. I won't share my own serpentine thoughts with you because, well, I find them disturbing. But From time to time as humans, sinister thoughts can enter into our heads and sometimes they're fleeting, right? Like they're here, they're gone the next second, but other times there can be this lingering in these thoughts, a playing out in our heads about what might happen if we did indeed act on these serpentine thoughts. And and this is how I've come to imagine Jesus' temptation in the wilderness, lingering, disturbing, serpentine thoughts come to Jesus from the Satan, and then Jesus maybe starts to linger on them a little, entertain them. And suddenly these are no longer just wayward thoughts, they've become 
temptations, real temptations. Temptations that Jesus may have seriously considered acting upon because you see a temptation's not really a temptation if you don't seriously consider acting upon it, right? I mean, th think of it this way. Have you ever watched one of those crime show television shows or movies, right? Like in the mind of a serial killer or, or maybe you're watching CSI or Dexter. Remember Dexter? Some show like that, you get to the end of the show and then maybe something pops into your head. You know what? If I were going to kill someone, how would I do it? How would I get away with it? How could I commit the perfect crime? Or, or if I killed someone, how, how would I want to run away and escape and create another identity? Now, we're separated over here by the internet, by the web, right? But tell me I'm not alone, friends. Otherwise, I've just started off this Good Friday on a rather awkward note. Everybody thinking, oh my goodness, this pastor plots to kill people. Now, trust me, I don't. I mention this for a reason. You see, we might call those moments after watching a TV show, we might call them a dark mind trips, perhaps, something disturbing, probably not healthy, but... Rarely would we call those an actual temptation. They're thought experiments brought on by some sort of external source, TV, movie, whatever. They're not an actual temptation. Now here, let me tell you what an actual temptation looks like. You're at Costco. It's dark out. It's raining. It's cold. It's November or February, whatever it is. It's cold and you've got your cart packed and you go out into the parking lot. You realize your car is parked like a 10 minute walk from the nearest cart station, you unload all your groceries in your car, you're getting wet, you're soaked, you realize again how far it is to bring your cart back to the cart deposit station, and in that moment you go, maybe I should be one of those lazy people who just leaves their cart in the middle of the parking lot. You linger. That's a temptation. That's something you seriously consider. Hopefully none of us do. We're all good citizens. Or, or consider it this way. You see that online, you're on Facebook, whatever, Twitter, whatever, and you see that just post that just drives you mad, just drives you up the wall. It just seems so ridiculous. And, and in your head, you concoct the most delicious, perfectly cruel and clever dig that you could comment back to this person with. And I mean, maybe you're even sitting there typing it out. You know, ah, ah. And you're right there and you're lingering. I, you're thinking to yourself, I would look so smart, so clever. This person would know. They would feel in their guts if I hit enter that I was their moral and intellectual superior. And you have your finger hovering over the enter button. You want to hit enter. You're tempted. That's a real temptation. And what Jesus faced in that parched desert landscape were real temptations. They linger with him. He plays them over in his mind. His finger is hovering above the enter button, you could say. He, he's tempted. He wants to enact it. And of course, the Satan lays three temptations before Jesus in the wilderness. But one of those temptations in particular seems particularly trying and cruel to me. The devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor. It's been given to me and I can give it to anyone I want to. If you worship me, it will be all yours. The Satan says to Jesus, take a peek, Jesus, just take a peek here at Egypt. Babylon, Rome, on and on it goes. The kingdoms, the empires of the world throughout history, they're mine, Satan says. They belong to me, which of course raises a question. How do these kingdoms exactly belong to the Satan? Well, let's say this quickly. When human civilization decided at the dawn of time that human kingdoms and nations and empires would be founded on greed, war, violence, and theft, when that was decided, humanity gave authority to the Satan. I mean, can you even think of, when you think about the world, the geography, can you even think of an empire or kingdom or nation today that wasn't founded on those principles? War, greed, violence? I honestly can't. Not here at home in Canada, not Russia, not the U.S. All Kingdoms, empires, are founded on those principles. And when humanity made war, violence, greed, theft, the cornerstone 
of human kingdoms and empires. It surrendered its authority to the Satan. And so the devil takes a hard look. He says, take a hard look, Jesus, at all the kingdoms of the world. See them in their glory, Jesus. But also see, Jesus, the suffering they will cause. See it all in this momentary glimpse. I can hand the authority of them over to you right now. I'm the kingmaker, Jesus. I'm the one behind the scenes. I'm the one who makes it all happen. And so if you want it, just worship me. I can make you king of kings. Jesus, think about the good you could do. Think about all the good you could do. Do we, do we have a deal? Think about the good you could do. That, I think, perhaps tripped Jesus up. Think about all the good. And let's be perfectly honest here. This is a real temptation for Jesus. This is not a charade. This is the big one. This is a tempting and attractive offer. And why? Because, well, everyone wants to rule the world, right? I mean, even if you don't personally want to rule the world yourself, you at least want your team your party, your people ruling it. I mean, just imagine the good I could do, the good we could do. And not only the good you could do, the suffering you could alleviate. This is a real temptation for Jesus. Jesus, I can give you that power, whispers the Satan. Do we have a deal? This is essentially a, a means, the ends justifying the means. This is a Robin Hood scenario, hey, if you're going to steal from the rich and give it to the poor, I guess that justifies things. Or I mean, think of Dexter. I mentioned that earlier. This is, hey, if you're a serial killer who only kills the bad guys, is that so bad? This is the premise, I would say, of every war from every side, whether it's fighting for freedom and democracy or denazifying a country, however you want to frame it. This sort of rationale always comes behind it. Killing a few bad people for the greater good... That's acceptable. Think of the good you could do. And so this is a real temptation for Jesus. It's powerful. But Jesus draws deep, and this is the important of, importance of tradition. Jesus draws real deep on his own tradition, and he quotes back scripture to himself, to his mind, to these serpentine thoughts, the Satan. Jesus answered, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Jesus resists. Because what he knows is this, what you worship will be what you serve. And so if as a people we worship guns and violence, what you will end up serving is guns and violence. If as a people we worship consumption, we will end up serving consumption. If as a people you worship power, you will end up serving power. But behind them all stands the Satan. Worship whatever it is you like, consumption, violence, power... And you end up serving the Satan. And so Jesus resists. Because he knows that while he may be able to do good with this power, while he might be able to alleviate suffering, he will only be serving the Satan. He resists the temptation to rule the world by way of power, by the will to power, and instead he submits to the will of God and the way of love. And those two things always, I think, stand as opposites, right? The way of power, the will of God. But here's the thing. In the wilderness, when Jesus chooses the will and way of God over the will and way of power, it puts him on a trajectory. It's one of those marquee moments in Jesus' life. It would define where his story would head and where it would come to an end on Good Friday. The moment Jesus says no to the devil's offer to let him rule the world and instead chooses the will of the Father, which is the way of co-suffering love, that decision inevitably is leading and taking him to the cross. Some decisions we make as humans put us on a trajectory. And when Jesus turns down this offer, this temptation, puts him on a collision course with the cross. And this temptation would come back to haunt him. You see, it would return again to him in its fiercest form in the Garden of Gethsemane, the night before Jesus was crucified. Because Jesus has been on this trajectory leading to the cross, but now, now the walls are closing in on him. Time 
has run out. A plan is already afoot. The, the trajectory is about to find its conclusion. The moment of his rest is almost upon him. And, and once that time comes, there will be no escape. And so in his final moments, in that final hour, maybe two hours, while the Judas is retrieving the palace guards, in that hour, that two hours before his fate becomes settled, there in the garden of Gethsemane, Gethsemane, the temptation returns. The temptation from the wilderness comes back. There in the garden, you could say, Jesus faces a flashback temptation. Because some things you can't unsee. You ever seen something disturbing, maybe even delightful, something though that you can't get out of your head, can't get out of your mind, something you can't unsee? I think about uh, around 2015, 16, I don't know if you recall, but some of the images, the imagery we were getting from ISIS over the news, and if you weren't careful and went down a little bit of a rabbit hole, there was a whole lot of disturbing images coming from ISIS, and when you see things like that, you can't unsee it. Or I, I think about the time I spent in Kabira slums in Nairobi, watching children draw water next to a dead dog in the same stream. I mean, there are certain things that when you see them in life, you can't unsee. Some things can't be unseen, and my, my hunch is this, is that in the Garden of Gethsemane, I would suggest Jesus couldn't unsee two things. First, he could not unsee the images of crucifixions he had witnessed. You see, crucifixion was a broadly practiced form of execution in the ancient Rome, in, in, in the ancient world, sorry, but the, but the Romans sort of upped the ante with this. They used this particularly brutal form of execution as a means of producing social conformity. Get out of line and this is what's coming for you. They used it widely. It's, it's highly likely, very probable that Jesus, his disciples, anyone in the vicinity of ancient Israel would have seen numerous crucifixions. They would have seen it. They know what it did. I mean, the Roman politician Cicero, he's quoted as saying that crucifixion was the most cruel and hideous of tortures. The bodies of the condemned would remain on the cross, on crosses for days. Anyone in Jesus' day under Roman occupation, they would have witnessed the horrors of crucifixion. That's how Rome kept people in line. Those images would have been lodged in Jesus' head as he sweats it out in the garden. He couldn't unsee it. But I believe there was something else Jesus couldn't unsee. And that was what the Satan had dangled in front of him back in the wilderness. He'd seen it. All the nations and empires of this world, all their glory, he had seen it. He had seen himself ruling over them all. He had seen himself with power over all nations, all kingdoms, all, all empires. He had seen it. He had seen all the good he could do. He had seen all the suffering he could alleviate. So in the Garden of Gethsemane, the temptation returns to the point that Jesus is sweating as if he were bleeding he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My Father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. And what Jesus knew in that moment is that it was possible. He didn't have to drink from the cup of being crucified. There was another way. The Satan had showed him that way. All he had to do was make a choice. And time is running out, but there is still time. Worship the Satan. Worship the will to power, the way of power and Jesus, you won't ever have to drink from that cup. Gethsemane's temptation for Jesus was to do what every other would-be king has done and will do in that situation. Fight back. Kill the killers. Win the war. Rule the world. That was Jesus' temptation in Gethsemane, and his disciples have two swords on them, ready to go. That would be enough to start. They could defeat this squad of palace guards coming to arrest Jesus, and then after that, they could rearm. They could call on the Palm Sunday Masses. The whole nation is in Jerusalem. They could call upon that crowd, and they could fight. There was another way for Jesus. It had been dangled right in front of him. There was another way. It was the way of power. The wilderness temptation, 
and the Gethsemane temptation, they are one and the same. It's the temptation to choose the will to power, the way of power, over the way of God. And so you get the sense that there's this intense anguish in the garden scene. Not that cup, God. I don't want to do it. Must I really taste of that bitter cup? Please, there must be another way. And Jesus knows there is another way. The way of force. The way of power. But then the decision is made as he sweats it out. Yet not as I will, but as you will. And he went away a second time and prayed, My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. Jesus faces this temptation twice in his life, and it leads straight to Gethsemane, straight to the cross. And there in that moment, his mind made up, the soldiers come, and when his disciples see what's happening, they choose the way of power, they choose the way of force, they draw their swords, they're ready to fight, and Jesus stops them. No, don't you get it? That's not the way of God, that's not the will of love. No, put your swords away, because if you live by the sword, if you live by the gun, the tank, the bomb, you will die that way. And so Jesus doesn't give in. Not my will, but the will of God, the will and way of love. Jesus heads to the cross announcing, I choose love. And he declines the will and way of power, chooses the will and way of God, the will and way of love. And in that moment, he chooses to love no matter what, with no anger, no bitterness, no retaliation. And the day unfolds, as we know, he is arrested, he's tortured, he's tried, he's hung on a cross. And, and having chosen the will and way of God, the will and way of love there hanging on the cross, he cries out, Father, forgive them, because they don't know what they're doing. And Jesus follows the will of the Father, the way of love, all the way to the bitter end, all the way to its conclusion. And then he breathes his last. It's finished. He has followed the way of love the whole way. And now it is finished, God. Into your hands I commit my spirit. And the scene around the cross ends. Jesus on the cross follows and finishes the way of love all the way to the end. And when it is finished, all he can do at that point is trust. Trust that following the way of love would not ultimately be a wasted defeat. He surrenders his fate into the trust of God. And you know, I think that this lesson is perhaps the hardest lesson of all for the Christian, for the church to learn. Can we trust that the way of love is not ultimately a waste of time and defeat? It's hard to trust that. It's hard. Because here's the thing, the way of love rarely earns you adoration and praise. The way of love rarely earns you a lot of money. The way of love rarely gives you influence. The way of love rarely gets legislation passed. And the way of love never wins a war. But here's what you can be sure of. The way of love, it will, it will get you crucified. One way or the other, choose the will of God and the way of love and you will die, if not on a cross, then in a thousand little ways in this life. And so the church, the Jesus path person, all of us at some point in our life, multiple times must enter the garden of Gethsemane and sweat it out just like Jesus did. Because there is another way. We don't have to drink of the cup of crucifixion. We don't have to follow the path of Jesus. There is another way because you do, you know what does get you a lot of adoration and praise, what gets you a lot of money, what gets you a lot of influence. Do you know what does get legislation passed and what does win wars? Power. Power achieves that. The way of power. And for centuries now, the church has kept drinking from that cup. The church, be it in Russia this very day, 
with Orthodox priests christening war machines, be it in the U.S. with pastors vying for politicians in Supreme Court seats, be it in Canada with pastors and churches joining the Freedom Convoy. This has always, always, always been the hardest lesson for the Christian and the church to learn. When it comes to the temptation, to the will and way of power, the church fails over and over and over again. But where we would fail, Christ succeeds. Where the church keeps thinking to itself, if we can just win this war, win that court seat, get our party in power, get enough influence, just get enough power, then we can accomplish the will of God on earth. And, and I think at those moments, the Satan must just smirk and smile. They keep falling for it every time he chuckles. It's like catnip to us humans. Can't resist it. Whenever the church chooses the way of power, be it in Russia, Canada, the U.S., we end up worshiping and serving the Satan. But again, where we fail again and again, where the church fails again and again, Jesus succeeds. And he resists the temptation to power. But the scene for us on Good Friday closes in silence. There is no verdict. There's only the silence of death. And in the end, there were no guarantees for Jesus. He simply followed the way of love all the way to the end, all the way to the bitter end, all the way to death. And when it was finished, he simply surrendered his spirit and trust to God. But on that Friday, there is no answer. I got around last week to watching the final installment of Lord of the Rings with my kids. And uh, yeah, they're probably too young for it, but don't really care. So we finally got to watch the final chapter together. We'd seen the first two over the past few months, finally watched Return of the King together, and you know, again, it didn't go well. Evie apparently had a nightmare about orcs, and she's lying, of course. She does that all the time, just so she can try to come sleep in our bed with us, but apparently she had a bad dream about orcs, but it doesn't matter. They need to learn the beauty of the story. It's a great story. You know, I've a bit, become a bit re-obsessed with The Lord of the Rings lately. 20, 20 years ago they came out. Can you believe that? I feel old. But I love them then, and they all hold up. They all, the, well, The Return of the King, the ending, it takes a little while. But fantastic story, fantastic, fantastic book. And the, and, 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 and the story is so rich with theology. I was reminded again of just how brilliant this story is theologically, because... What is the theology of Lord of the Rings? Well, consider the ring. What is the ring? It is the will in the way of power. One ring to rule them all, one ring to find them, one ring to bring them all, and in the darkness, bind them. And it's interesting because everyone in the films and the books, everyone save a few, they think they can use the ring of power without being corrupted by it. I mean, consider Boromir, right? We should use the ring for good, he thinks. Think of all the good we could do. What's interesting to me in the films, the book, is it's only the very humblest that seem to be immune to the lure of the ring. The rest of them are deceived. It's only the very, very humblest that seem to be immune to this. And, and so the Lord of the Rings gives us a most unlikely hero. And it's not Gandalf, though. Of course, he's wise enough to, to resist carrying the ring at all. He's wise. He knows he cannot take up that power. He knows well that he can't be the hero. And the hero is also not Frodo. Because carrying the ring of power takes an incredible toll on him. It ends up corrupting even him, and that's the fascinating thing, even the humble one who would carry the ring, who would take on that burden, is corrupted by power. The hero isn't Strider or Aragon, the hero is Samwise Gamgee. He's the true hero. Simple gardener from the Shire, and what makes him the hero is he has no aspirations to power, zero aspirations to be the hero. He's the one who doesn't want to rule the world. He's not interested in that, and that's why he becomes the true hero of the story. But the message of the Lord of the Rings, I would say the message of the cross as well, is this. If you choose the way of power, eventually you will bring harm to the world, and you will ruin your soul. That's the message of the cross. It's the message of Jesus resisting 
those temptations. This is the message of the Lord of the Rings. The message is, whoa, if you take up the mantle of power, inevitably, eventually, you will harm the world and harm your own soul. But that's so hard to believe. We think, no, 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 no. I really would do good with it. Me or, or my team, my people, we would do such good things with power. I mean, I'm convinced of it half the time. It's a shame I don't speak French. I've often thought if I spoke French, I, you know, maybe I could run for prime minister one day. But that's precisely the point, is that all of us in our minds are, are, are pretty much convinced that if we did have power, we would do good with it. But it's the mistake everyone in the Lord of the Rings makes. It's the mistake the church keeps making over and over again. But Jesus did not. And Tolkien knew what Jesus knew. Cling to the ring of power. Take on the role of power. Eventually you will harm the world and ruin your own soul. And I just discovered this week doing some research on Tolkien. A fascinating excerpt from a letter that he wrote to his son. He wrote this to his son in the height of World War II. The world is fighting Nazi Germany, right? The Axis powers. And he wrote this to his son. We are attempting to conquer Sauron with the ring, and we shall, it seems, succeed. But the penalty is, as you will know, to breed new Saurons and slowly turn men and elves into orcs. You can't fight the enemy with his own ring without turning into an enemy. Like Jesus, every one of us must at some point head to the garden and sweat it out like Jesus did. We must wrestle with the temptation. What path do we want to travel? The way of and will to power or Jesus' path, the path of self-sacrificial love. And in all likelihood, of course, we won't face the massive consequences that Jesus did. Our, our time in the garden will be smaller and, of course, to a lesser degree. And, and when it comes to us, though, we will still have to sweat it out and make our choice. The Jesus path, the way of self-sacrificial love, or the way of power. And we'll have to make our choice in the same way that Jesus did without a verdict, and without certainty around what the outcome will be, we will simply be asked, as Jesus was, to trust. In fact, we'll be asked to utter the five most difficult words a person of faith can ever utter. Not my will, your will. As we wait in the silence of this holy weekend, may each of us find the courage and fortitude of Jesus, who in the end chose the will of God and the way of love. Friends, on this Good Friday, may you go in peace.